As you're likely aware, Elden Ring is the latest release from developers From Software, the studio responsible for 2009's Demon Souls. Elden Ring could be considered a spiritual successor to that flagship title, as the two are dark fantasy adventure games with a focus on deliberate combat and grotesque enemy design. They share a similar user interface, and many mechanics remain untouched from the original. However, where Demon's Souls was a linear action game, set in cramped castles, undead burgs and poisoned bogs, Elden Ring is a grand open world, where these familiar locales can be reached by wide fields. The game is receiving rave critical response, and for good reason. Its world is chock full of detail, and fully realises a setting we only got snippets of in previous titles. It's one of the few games that can truly boast there's something around every corner with bandit camps, hidden dungeons and optional monsters placed deliberately for players to engage with. Its more freeform approach also takes a sting out of the Souls series' famous difficulty, as players really can head off in another direction if they become overwhelmed with a particular challenge. It's learnt all the best lessons of previous open world games, and does avoid a few of its worst mistakes, like overly telegraphing where players should go. It can't quite shake off the sins of its contemporaries, however, with systems like crafting that bog up your inventory and map stations that flatten exploration. But what do I think of it? Well, as much as I do respect its grand accomplishments, I'm not quite seeing its revolutionary design. Perhaps it's because it does feel all too familiar. Elden Ring could be best summed up as open world Dark Souls and how excited that makes you will be heavily affected by how many Souls and open world games you've previously played. Demon's Souls, Dark Souls 1 and 2 I consider pretty great games, even if I'm not a fan of their grind. Importantly, they all feel somewhat distinct in their level and encounter design, but I wasn't so invested in them that I wanted to retread their ground a third time round, or make a console investment on two spin-offs. As for open world games, I recently covered Halo Infinite, and had a lot of fun with its brand new untethered structure. Many of the reasons I did are, well, exactly why I like Elden Ring, and other open world games. Freedom of approach, and a spread of options to problem solve. Where these games lose their luster, and where I imagine the same will happen for Elden Ring, is when eventually the open world limits itself, and all those approaches you had to problem solve are flattened into the same few power weapons and items. To misquote Abraham Manslow, if the only tool you have is a hammer, every problem is going to look like a nail. In short, I like Elden Ring, but I don't love it, and certainly wouldn't call it a completely new take on open world games. But it was that talk of it being this great evolution on the genre, and comparisons to another game in particular, that rekindled my affection for the Elden Ring of 2017, the first game that one of Guerrilla's Horizon titles was unfortunately compared to. I am, of course, referring to The Legend of Zelda, Breath of the Wild. If I wanted to, I could go through and explain all the things that Breath of the Wild pilfers from previous games. It has towers familiar in form and function to the ones in Assassin's Creed, where venturing to their highest point fills in details on a map. It has crafting, although in a simplified and specific form. Being a Legend of Zelda game, it also carries over many of that series' trademark mechanics like Combat Lock-On, as well as remixed fantasy races and places that have been consistent for nearly 40 years. But whereas I can't help but feel like Elden Ring is overly familiar, Breath of the Wild never breaks the illusion of being its own thing. If I had to sum up why, it's that Breath of the Wild fully embraces a total freedom of approach. Summed up best by essayist King K, the designers behind the game took Zelda's trademark puzzle solving and applied it to an entire open world. If I could only deal with threats by sword and shield, I'd start to think about Dark Souls, 
But there's so much more in Breath of the Wild. Even beyond the number of weapons that can be picked up, including bows and arrows, there's also strange powers like magical explosives, time stopping and freezing that are available to Link. There's also the world itself. A player could cut down a tree and use it for cover and collateral. They could throw their sword into the middle of a stormy environment, knowing that it will attract lightning and hit a number of foes. If they wanted to, players could pick up a treasure chest with magnetic magic and bash foes around. Each of these solutions feels natural, and because there's so many new approaches, it makes stock combat feel new. And this ethos is baked into the experience of Breath of the Wild. For example, the opening tutorial area gives Link a linear and specific goal to achieve complete four puzzle shrines. Each is in its own zone of the starting biome, and one in particular is in a deadly tundra. Her ghosts bend too long there unprotected, and Link bites the dust. But Breath of the Wild has more than one potential solution for keeping Link warm. He can carry a lit torch that surrounds him in protective warmth, eat spicy peppers to raise his body temperature, or if he's willing to seek out particular ingredients, he can make a dinner for an old man that gives him a comfortable cold beating jacket in return. Each solution is better than the other, spicy peppers only keep him warm for so long, and a torch takes away Link's ability to fight, making the jacket the smart choice if players go out of their way for it. The thing is, each of these solutions are completely viable, whereas a normal open world game may flatten that choice into one prescribed solution. The revolution of Breath of the Wild is that this cleverness is applied to Zelda's core pillars – traversal, combat, and puzzle solving. Although quests may only give Link a single goal to achieve, there's no prescribed solution for how that's done. Even bosses can be somewhat overcome beyond swords and arrows. In the years since its release, people are still finding new ways to play in Breath of the Wild. That said, I don't think Breath of the Wild reaches its potential for true greatness. But not through any fault of its own. Sure, there's issues like asset reuse and flat combat, but those could be improved in a sequel. Its major issue is one that is baked into its very design. Having so many solutions for problem solving means players are unlikely to discover all of them, especially in an open world where they may not talk to every NPC or witness every chemical reaction. Considering the increase in difficulty from previous Zelda games, players may also be reluctant to try some experimental solutions when safer options exist. Like I said previously, the nadir of open world games is when one solution becomes dominant, likely because of power weapons and item flattening choice. Breath of the Wild suffers somewhat with this, due to permanent heart and stamina upgrades, which over time take away the importance of needing to cook food to improve Link's statistics, which creates a disinterest in the crafting system. To go back to my previous example, the warm coat took away the potential discovery of using a torch, which may have come in useful in a later section. The designers were aware of this somewhat, as they attempted to rectify combat with Breath of the Wild's controversial weapon degradation system. Although it does stop any one weapon being relied on, and gets players trying everything out, it misses nuance, and doesn't feel as if Link nor the player becomes more proficient with any of these items. In short, there's a lot to do in Breath of the Wild, but that choice is somewhat polarising. Although many have proposed potential solutions for improving Breath of the Wild a second time round, including a great video by Essayist Rasbutin that I may or may not have made the thumbnail for, there's one potential idea that I've yet to see proposed. Perhaps it's because it's quite controversial, and on a surface level runs counter to the complete freedom of approach that Breath of the Wild is so revolutionary for. And yet, Playing Elden Ring for so many hours now, it could just be what the Zelda series needs to show off just how great these systems are. Although there's some irony in me finding Elden Ring too familiar, only to then propose its most familiar feature as something new for Zelda, I will show off that it can make Breath of the Wild feel brand new. In fact, you at home could even try it yourself after watching the video. So. What should Zelda learn from Elden Ring? So, what should Zelda learn from Elden Ring? 
The series doesn't need FromSoft's patented difficulty, nor dark fantasy aesthetic. Although I would love Breath of the Wild's dungeons and shrines to be integrated into the world like Elden Ring's optional areas are. No, what should be looked at is something more core to its design. I won't put a spoiler warning here, because the solution isn't some way into the game, because it actually happens the moment you start, before its tone setting cutscene and mandatory boss fight to die to. I'm referring to the character creation screen. The character creator in Elden Ring asks a player not just what their character looks like, but also their starting class. Each has their own statistics, weapon and gear fitting of each archetype. There's armoured and broadsword wielding knights, magic slinging but weak magicians, and plenty of variation in between. Where Elden Ring differs from most open world games is that these archetypes heavily affect how the rest of the game will be played. A knight has to attack in close quarters with the game's challenging enemies, but a magician can shoot missiles from the sidelines, which naturally lowers the difficulty. More importantly, there is a large cost to levelling up. Each upgrade gets prohibitively more expensive, no matter which stat they're put in. As these characters are all pre-specs, the intent is to put points into what they already do best. For example, a knight can naturally tank hits and lift large swords, but there's always room for improvement, so a player shouldn't waste points on stats that would increase their magical aptitude instead. On the flip side, a magician is a glass cannon, so improving their spell slinging and dexterity is key, so they can roll out of immediate dangers and then blow them away. A player could eventually gather enough points that they could max out a character in all levels, but Elden Ring intends that a player character will stick within its chosen class with only small variations. Of course, this doesn't cover the depraved class that starts with even stats across the board, but hey, whatever. This fixes what I think is the major issue of most open world games. The power problem. When there's so many choices available, players will end up gravitating towards the ones that are the most guaranteed. As Soren Johnson, lead designer of Civilization 4, once said, given the opportunity, players will optimise the fun out of a game. This was the exact issue I had with Halo Infinite's open world, and it's the exact same one that covers Breath of the Wild's potential. Elden Ring solves the power problem by getting a player to essentially stay in their lane. Making levelling so expensive means that players will focus on what a class does best, which leads to locking out other options. For example, it'd be difficult for a knight to respec into a magician. The fortunate thing is, a player never feels as if they are being hamstrung, because Elden Ring is designed around every classed option being viable. The game is cryptic, with some mechanics only revealing themselves through experimentation. Although knights can't cast fireballs, they can coat their weapons in fire for a similar effect. Players could miss this if they just go for the easy option. It also means replayability becomes a lot more appealing, when content isn't available the first route through. Although it doesn't look it, Breath of the Wild also allows a player to apply a class-based approach, just like Elden Ring. Although early on all links are going to start with the same abilities, a player can then further specialise. Someone who really enjoys the game's combat will focus on spending shrine orbs improving Link's health, getting the best weapons and brewing elixirs that enhance his strength. A player who enjoys the climbing will instead spend orbs on stamina, seek out gear that improves traversal and drink potions to up speed. Using all the game's available enhancements, Link can be reworked into any of Elden Ring's classes, and then immediately benefit from what that game's class system does so well. It avoids any one solution becoming dominant, and it encourages experimentation. Just for transparency's sake, this wasn't an original thought. In fact, it was inspired by two others. The first was essayist Heavy-Eyed, who pointed out that Link can essentially become different classes in his own video on Breath of the Wild. The second inspiration was content creator Chip Cheesem. In 2019, he completed a Let's Play series on Metal Gear Solid 5. Unique in his approach was that he completed three entirely separate playthroughs that forced Big Boss into a unique personality. The first was inspired by the classic Metal Gear games, focusing on using only stealth and non-lethal weapons to complete missions. The second was the opposite, employing the game's deadliest artillery and loudest tactics to do the same. 
The third was the wild card. Quite literally. This big boss could only use additional gadgets, environmental quirks and joke items to complete missions. Not only were all three completely viable, they didn't cross over with each other. His own imposed restriction showed off all the great versatility this game's weapons and items have. It certainly solved MGS 5s power problem, because power items and guaranteed solutions were a lot behind particular playstyles. It even showed off the game's multiple failure states, and plot divergences that most players, including myself, didn't even know about. So if you wanted to, right now, you could prototype this idea with your own copy of Breath of the Wild. Choose a specific class type from Elden Ring, Dungeons and Dragons or another game system, and replicate them as closely as you can with in-game costumes, gear, consumables, and a strict mindset on how to play. I tried a few playthroughs with this in mind to see how effective it was. So here's how my experiment panned out. I decided to start with a knight. I took Link to Hyrule Castle to replicate Demon Souls, fighting monsters with only a sword and shield in hand, focusing on the strength of Link's gear and weapons instead of his own hearts and stamina, and outfitting with lots of health consumables to make up for the fact. Climbing I attempted to restrict to a minimum, as I did pausing the game on a dime to drink a consumable item, instead looking for any safety areas to do so. Sheikah Slate usage was also restricted. The experience was a lot of fun, and certainly more tense than my previous visits to the castle were. Because I couldn't use my slate or arrows too often, I had to figure out the timing of parrying attacks, something that in my previous playthroughs I never did. Although I could have saved the princess, my intent was to weed out monster numbers, as well as find treasures I could later trade in to put towards new arrows and ingredients for cooking. Whilst returning from the castle, I decided to apply this idea to a found Sheikah Shrine, with this knight mentality in mind. In this puzzle's example, you have to rotate a cube to light several torches, avoiding the water putting them out. I skipped this step by instead using fire arrows to light the torches. Despite being a dumb solution, I felt pretty smart that this actually worked. Then I tried out being a sneaky ranger. I focused on only using gear that made Link's footsteps quieter, at the cost of his personal defence. As a personal touch, I even tried to keep to dark colours and only scout during the nights under cover of darkness. For protection, I only carried bows and arrows, and for any melee combat, I would have to use scavenged weapons. As for what motivated me, I focused on what a ranger does best keep their lands protected from monsters and menaces. In my playthrough, I mostly sauntered around looking for monsters, taking the stealthy approach to deal with them. Unlike the knight, I did use a lot more climbing, with the justification that my clothing was lighter than his suit of armour. The adventure brought me into arrow battles against Yiga clan members, as well as a small adventure where I cleared out some ruins of bandit camps. Like the knight, I collected any treasures I could find to trade in towards arrows and cooking ingredients. Through this roleplay mindset, I even tried some goofier concepts. I had Link forego adventuring and retire to a life of rock climbing, whereas satisfaction came not from defeating Ganon, but instead reaching the highest peaks in Hyrule. Apart from a warm jacket for the coldest peaks, this Link only had his climbing gear, and no weapons or Sheikah Slate to protect himself. Instead, just like a real life boulderer, he'd carry a few small elixirs and bits of food. Oh, I should add, this Link was also a vegetarian, so any cooking he did couldn't factor in meat, despite it being one of the heartier foods in the game. He had high stamina to make up for his low health, due to the focus on mainly traversal. As for what motivated him, it was mostly getting selfies from mountaintops. And I suppose he could also find rare gems on his treks to trade in. To encourage using all the game's weirder combat options, I tried out a wizard class, using only the Sheikah Slate to attack enemies and experiment with traversal. This wasn't easy however, because so few of the Sheikah Slate options can do direct harm. Rather, it's only when experimenting with a chemistry system where it pays off. For example, I tried to use a floating sword to attract lightning to an area with little luck. 
The same was true when I attempted being a beastmaster, feeding wolves haunches of meat so they befriended Link and attacked on his behalf. The thing is, this play experiment got me to better appreciate all the systems Breath of the Wild had. The reason was because it restricted what I could and, importantly, couldn't do. When only the Sheikah Slate is your means of interacting with the world, you get a bit more creative with it. When sword combat is in play, you get used to its quirks and nuance. The key thing that I learned throughout all of them was that there were a few systems in Breath of the Wild I couldn't cut out completely. As you're unable to buy warm meals or pre-bottled elixirs, being able to cook is necessary for all classes. As the only way they're able to level up is via hearts and stamina containers, having a means to complete shrines is also heavily important. As for trading, some links were able to turn a profit through many of the foods and elixirs they made, which would make a non-combat or active class like say a cook or potions brewer completely possible. As gemstones are so plentiful, players can even focus on being a miner and live out the rest of their days chipping away at the environment. The most important thing I got out of it though was, even when I couldn't use a Sheikah Slate or crafting pieces or even weapons, I was still having a lot of fun. But it was purely intrinsic. Right now, Breath of the Wild can't currently reward players for sticking to a specific class, in a way that Elden Ring at least rewards levelling your class by making them better in what they already do best. The experiment could stop there, and I'd be happy saying that playing Breath of the Wild like Elden Ring's classes is a great way to reappreciate the game. But there's more to be considered. Although all of what I am suggesting is currently doable in Breath of the Wild, it's not encouraged by the game's system. That's by design, of course. The one class you build is Link, and Link can do pretty much everything. But because of that, no one thing feels like it reaches the potential it could, and as the game goes on, options are limited, not intentionally, but due to the power problem. If classes were to be taken seriously, heavier restrictions would need to be put in place. It would mean that Nintendo takes all those cool mechanics Link could theoretically play with, and gate them off. In this theoretical scenario, Link would have the Great Plateau to play with all these available options. Before setting off, however, the player would be given a choice of where they want to study further. So, for example, by choosing to focus on melee weapons, it could unlock additional weapons arts, but at the cost of no longer having the ability to use bows or magic. Players could also be told that only specific shrines will help level up that playstyle, throwing Link into combat challenges benefiting for those skills. Then, players could be given a choice on where to diversify Link. Perhaps they could make him heartier, or resistant to certain elements, or make him more proficient in spears over swords. But that would have to come at the cost of no longer being able to choose those other options. This system could even work in heart and stamina containers as potential means to upgrade. Or they could be sold off for cash to be spent on better gear. Each choice begets new choices. There is no ultimate link to strive for, but one who is the best in his particular field. And because Breath of the Wild already has so much freedom to approach problem solving, each link build is totally viable. By the game's end, a player is going to have their own unique hero of Hyrule. Once again, for the sake of transparency, I might have been inspired beyond Shizdalden Ring. In his video covering Deus Ex Human Revolution, Essayist H. Bomberguy sums up what is great about this system when he compares Human Revolution to the original Deus Ex. In the newer game, the character of Adam Jensen has dozens of abilities to unlock, and if a player puts in the effort, all of them can be by the end of the game. In the original Deus Ex, though, there are objects called All Canisters that allow main character J.C. Denton to likewise unlock abilities. The catch is, each canister only contains two abilities, and only one can be chosen. It means that, even if a player is fortunate enough to find all the orb canisters, they can't have all the game's potential abilities. And this is an awesome system for role-playing, because it means that a player's JC Denton is personalised, and it feels as if he is gaining new abilities. Meanwhile, Human Revolution feels as if it's withholding abilities that Adam Jensen has from the get-go, and that by the end game, a player will have the exact same Adam Jensen as everybody else. Of course, this ties in with the power issues, where players are going to naturally break characters by going for power options to solve tedious endgame challenges, instead of playing to a class mindset. 
The newer XCOM games know the benefit of this two-choice system. Each soldier can fall into one of four classes, and as they level up they can be further specialised. For example, a sniper can either improve his long-range weapons ability, or his short range. It means that you can turn them into an unseen assassin that can react to threats only their squad can see, or a gunman that can fan their pistol at multiple foes each round. Or hey, even something in between. I understand this might not be to everyone's taste, however. On a surface level, this would go against the game's revolutionary design, as Link can no longer on the fly switch between options. But I'm not suggesting these options are removed entirely, just that players have to work for them, just like they'd have to in Elden Ring. Like I said though, I ended up having a great time with this self-imposed restriction throughout my entire game time with Breath of the Wild. Compare this to say, Halo Infinite, where by the time I unlocked the best weapons or items, each mission ended up becoming a little rote. Even the best knight or ranger are going to be thrown into situations where a magician is better suited, but that's where things like the game's chemistry system is going to shine its brightest. In fact, it may become like the boss fights of old Zelda games, where there's that great aha moment of overcoming a great challenge through your own wits. That said, there is one way that all these options are available for a player to enjoy, without breaking the rule of having a Link who's able to do everything. And for once, this is something that I actually haven't seen done well in any other game previously. Elden Ring reminds me of some great tabletop games I've played, but it misses the multiplayer aspect. The game does allow you to summon other players into the world, but only to fight other bosses. They don't really become part of the narrative. So, inspired somewhat by the fact that the Souls games I've played, including Elden Ring, have squeezed extra replayability out of its distinct classes, it'd be great if there was a way that all your different characters could occupy the same world, and work together to overcome challenges. One way this could be done is if the world was consistent across multiple characters. For example, a player could hop in as their knight to clear out a bandit camp, then hop back in as their magician to plunder loot. A particular boss could be more challenging for one class to take on, giving you the choice of sending in the best person for the job at the cost of a lower payout, or challenging yourself in return for extra levels and maybe some additional perk. Perhaps characters could be swapped at a designated location, like a clubhouse where cool mounts could be put on the wall, cash could be spent on a jukebox, or I guess more tonally appropriate, items could be swapped between player characters. This would certainly eliminate the awkward potential of being able to swap between characters on the fly, like the Lost Vikings or Trine, and would retain the Souls experience of being a single, tailor-made character fighting on their own. On the opposite end, this could encourage the same poor design that ruined Donkey Kong 64, where challenges were so tightly tied to each individual Kong, and swapping them was so annoying. Instead, this system should lean into the limitations of the characters, but not make problems to be solved so limited to match them. That said, having multiple specific heroes in the same world could also take a cue from another massive open world game, Grand Theft Auto V. In that game's single player content, the story is split between the point of view of three protagonists, Michael, Franklin and Trevor. Although the game is not explicitly an RPG, each character does have their own stats across multiple disciplines, and even have unique magical abilities. Bullet time, bullet time but driving, and angry mode. What's interesting however is that these three are living entities in San Andreas. With a push of a button, your consciousness switches between them, catching them in the middle of whatever they'd be doing in that day to day. The plot also treats them as free individuals, and occasionally has you switch between them on missions to use their special perks and show you the action from several perspectives. This system is genuinely cool, although not that developed in GTA V. Having multiple protagonists could have opened opportunities for them taking on the same single person missions, thus forcing the choice of whether to take the shooter, driver or maniac. This is something that unfortunately doesn't happen much outside of the side content. This system could be put to better use in our hypothetical scenario. In general, the characters could be off having their own adventures in the world whilst you're playing as someone else. They're not levelling up, but they might be collecting crafting materials or seeing the sights. But there could be opportunities where you could bring both characters into the same situation, 
If we used as an example, say, the Tower Knight boss from Demon Souls, one character could take care of the soldiers in the top area while another fights the boss below, and you have to carefully hop between these characters to pull off their special abilities. It would be akin to calling in a Phantom to fight alongside you, except there'd be the option to hop between your player character and the Phantom when a combat opportunity opens. There'd be a fun challenge in not just coordinating your own character, but another at the same time, adding a nice layer of strategy you usually don't see in an open world game. If Zelda were to take a class-based approach, this party of one could be totally applicable. The series has already experimented with multiplayer modes, where each link transforms into a subclass to solve a problem for the whole. In the Four Swords Adventures, when they're not pushing a big rock together, usually these links are split up and using their own abilities. One may be an archer hitting targets, the other using a hammer on a button, whilst another keeps enemies away from the other two. Thus, they work to solve a larger problem. This goes too for Triforce Heroes, which introduced clothing that gives Link specific perks years before Breath of the Wild. In Nintendo Land's facsimile of The Legend of Zelda, players with Wii Motion Plus are melee fighters, whilst the one player with the Wii U gamepad is an archer. With the former work on ground enemies, it is the sniper's job to take out their competitors and hit way off targets. It's a great piece of asymmetry, and something that could be replicated in software without hardware. Something that, if a class-based system restricted players to only certain weapon types, magic use, health and stamina and resistance, would absolutely do so. Although this could be replicated on the fly in Breath of the Wild, the next step would be incentivizing people to stick to their classes. Like I said earlier, having level ups tied to jobs these links would be doing. For example, turning in bounties or crafting materials for rupees to spend on spirit orbs, or completing combat or Sheikah magic challenges for them. Then, like XCOM, there should be some restriction in what they can level up into. Rather than having one ultimate link, you have a few links all specialised in certain disciplines, all out in the open world working towards the ultimate big goal. Much like how the ending shows the power of all the champions working together to whittle down Ganon's health, this would be that, but totally player driven. And that, I think, is pretty awesome. I may have been a little negative towards Elden Ring, but I suppose if there's one thing I can praise it for, is that it rejuvenates my hope that open world games can innovate again. Although many out there are great at what they do, they somehow all fall into a trap of giving players way too much without some direction, which leads to players optimising out the fun. Instead, these games could create affection by truly embracing the characters that lead them. The best kind of problem solving happens not because the players have unlimited resources, but because they're allowed to exploit the few resources they have. The same goes for Elden Ring, and the same could go for Breath of the Wild with a little player restriction. Having returned to the latter game recently, it's amazing just how little surface I've scratched away. Considering there's still cool exploits and technology being discovered, it seems like most of us haven't either. To put my mind into that of the developer, this was always intentional, and that my personal suggestions will run counter to the ethos behind Breath of the Wild. That said, if Nintendo really wanted to show off just how many approaches a player could take, playing some restriction would be the best way of doing it. There's plenty of great challenges in the game, like Eventide Island and the Master Challenges that get close, but restricting the game around building Link into a class could just be the ultimate thesis of that. Like I said, Breath of the Wild is already fully functional enough that you can do that right now if you apply some discipline, but having the incentive to do so would be awesome. Take some inspiration from Deus Ex Org canisters, XCOM soldier levelling and GTA V's multiple characters. So instead of having one character be a jack of all trades, let players cycle through an entire cast who are masters of one, each with their own unique quirks and roles to play in the story. There's little we know right now about the second Breath of the Wild game, and it could be likely that some of these ideas may show up there. If not, I'm happy to pass along my video to Nintendo. Let players build a cool adventurer's guild of specific static up links or other heroic Hylians to go and solve various problems around the kingdom. After all, the series has been around for so long that there's likely only a few places it can innovate. At least until Nintendo proves us wrong again. As for Elden Ring, I'll keep at it, and maybe hope that some of my fondness for Breath of the Wild helps me see it in a different light. Maybe I just haven't figured out the right class to play as yet. 
Hey, if you enjoyed this long thought experiment, you might like some of my previous videos on the subject matter of RPG design. Last year I dived into the development of my own tabletop podcast, Quest and Show. I built a custom system for that game where players essentially design their own class from picking three starting skills, one speciality and two pieces of gear. Although this is a lot more flexible than other systems, players are also locked into these choices. The intent is that they will roleplay within these parameters they create for themselves and, when challenged out of their comfort zone, will think creatively with what they have to hand. Similar to what I'm proposing for this Elden Ring flavoured Breath of the Wild. And if you'd like to see this system in action, I have two whole seasons of Quest and Show uploaded, and Season 3 is in the midst of being recorded right now and is due for release later in the year. Before I wrap up, I'd also like to promote some of the videos I made mention of. This includes King K's Retrospective, Rasbutin's Fixing Breath of the Wild's Biggest Problems, Heavy Eyed's Design of the Great Plateau, Chip Cheesum's Metal Gear Solid 5 LP, and H Bomber Guy's Human Revolution is Fine and Here's Why. Links to these videos and mine will be in the description below. I've been James, and I'll see you all in the next upload.